Hello again and welcome back to another edition of Cardinal Sports Live. Joining me today again is Jet Spiegel in person and Noah Beaumont. Um, it is great to actually be able to sit down with both of you guys. How are you guys doing this week? Um, it's been a busy week so far, a lot of schoolwork and stuff, but it's nice to be back here with you guys finally in person, not over Zoom and stuff. So, you know, it's glad to be back and I think from here, hopefully the week goes up. Yeah, I hear you, Jed, on that schoolwork. Midterms are kind of hitting me hard, but I'm just glad to be able to talk sports with you guys tonight. I, yeah, I'm very excited to be able to talk with you guys. So let's just get straight into it. So we're bringing back again our little postponed sports segment. This week is going to be baseball. So um, it's no secret that the baseball team has had quite a few players um, go pro and be drafted. However, something interesting to note is that predominantly, at least in the last few years, They've been pitchers, so why do you think so many talented pitchers are coming to Ball State? Um, I'm actually going to have to start off with like going back a few years, and I know we have a new baseball pitching coach and everything, and uh, Larry, but I think we have to go back and look at Dustin, and he, he started a system with the pitching team where he made them work out by themselves 90 minutes before the practice, before the real team came out with everybody else, and they would practice by themselves with just 90 minutes of just throwing. And then he also had a lot of workload on them. So then throughout the season, they understood that, you know, you have to take a lot of workload to be a pitcher in the leagues and stuff and actually be good. So they would make them work a lot during practice and throw a lot of pitches so their arms are used to that workload. And then also he conditioned on, you know, accuracy and just good mentality with the pitchers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Larry, you know, he's already, had, he's already had 16 of his pitchers go to the MLB. And there's also that atmosphere that goes around in Ball State here that just real that makes you realize that this is where pitchers want to come if they want to go to the MLB someday. No, yeah, I agree. I think Blair's done a great job of implementing more to that and making it a little easier for them to go pro. Definitely, that's some great insights. So, how do you think you know as our reputation builds as a pitching school that other players can step up to the plate? You know, I just think they need to stay focused on not you know relying on the pitching. A lot, we relied on the pitching a lot last year, and I didn't think that was the best. We would come out with Kyle last year, and he would go five, six innings, and they would put up maybe one run and probably zero. But we would be down with zero or maybe be tied, maybe up by one. But with that, we need to have the strong pitchers come in, and then also the batters need to jump up and get themselves going. So then come in the sixth and seventh inning, when we have our relief pitchers in and closing pitchers, and they maybe don't do as well as the starting pitchers, we're not throwing the game away because we're only up by one and they scored three or four runs. That's just, I think we need to be a little better on that and get a couple more runs in the first couple innings to have our pitchers know we have their back. Definitely. And they have our back, uh, like the players on the field's back and everything. So I just think the batting just needs to get a little more confident with themselves. For sure, security runs are definitely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with you that, with you, that, with the, on, with you. <laughs> I'm gonna agree on you, with you, Jet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the team is hitting 249 as a whole, uh, but the, the part that is kind of hurting the team is the bottom three in the lineup. They're averaging uh, uh, 180 in those three, and that's obviously going to kill you if that, that could be three outs automatically. Yeah. And uh, they've also left 100, last season they left 135 on base, and if you average that out to the 16 games that they played, that's about eight runs that they could be scoring each game that they leave on the bags. We see the finish. Oh, definitely. Got to knock them in for yeah. sure, definitely. Yeah, but um, that is, again, great insight. But we're going to take a quick little break and see what head coach Rich Maloney has to say on the subject. But I just mainly wanted to kind of talk about how I feel as a Ball State has really become such a great school for pitchers to go to. So how do you influence such young, talented pitchers to come to Ball State? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, on my first journey here, uh, my first seven years, we were fortunate enough to have several pitchers, several players, period, um, that were high draft picks. Uh, in that time, there was uh, two pitchers, uh, actually, through, let me think here, Luke, uh, Jeff Urban, Luke Haggerty, and Brian Bullington were all first rounders with Brian being the number one pick overall. I also had two outfielders who were first rounders, Larry Bigby and Brad Snyder. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what happened is to answer your question, I think we took these, these young 
men who were um, long and wiry. So they were really tall and they were uh, in general pretty skinny. And then they ended up uh, gaining strength through our weight program. They end up through our long toss program being able to, as their body matured and we worked with them in building arm strength, they just got stronger and they started to add velocity. Now velocity is like a huge talk in Major League Baseball, but back then the uh, there wasn't all of these uh, basically like, like uh, training places to gain velocity. It was kind of a mystery. And fortunately for us, I think the body type of what we were able to recruit and the athleticism of the kids we were able to recruit and the, uh, I just thought my formula was if they're really tall and they haven't, they're not as strong as they can be and they're good athletes, that if we got them stronger, at a minimum, they're going to gain two or three miles an hour, maybe more than that, uh, just sheer physical maturity. If you get them on a good strength training program, and that's what we did. Uh, so I think we had the right kids with the with great athleticism, and they bought into a dream. Like we felt like uh, we we're going to build a program that was going to be uh, a force to be reckoned with. And so, uh, and at that time, uh, there was a little bit different than the landscape today because at that time, the recruiting, they didn't have all the showcases they have now. Mm -hmm. um, so kids weren't, uh, young men weren't seen as much by nationally. So if you worked really hard as a coach and you built relationships, you could find those uh, I don't know that they were diamond in the roughs, but kind of like uh, people that were a little bit off the radar mm -hmm. because the kids that we took most part were um, uh, they were good players like Brian Bowling was a special player right out of high school. The, re the rest of them, they were good players, um, but they hadn't even come close to reaching their uh, potential yet. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those late bloomers, we called them. Yeah. And, and we were able to, uh, you know, to land them. And then they got into a, our program and the system was set up to where they'd get stronger. Well, how have you been preparing the team as a whole, especially through COVID? Everything's really weird right now. Nobody could really practice for a while. Yeah, it was, it's been a challenge, uh, but it's been great being together um, because man, you know, you know, a lot of the, the uh, athletics right now talks about the fall sports, you know, not, mm -hmm. but we were the first, us and whoever else was available in the spring. We were, we were uh, 17 games into our season and um, maybe it was 16, something like that. But anyway, we were beginning our season and then it just got pulled from under us. And then we, we weren't together all the way from like March, 15th till um the boys returned in august for yeah. school and then we still weren't allowed to be together you know because then then it was like we couldn't even they couldn't even go to the field on their own in practice like they normally when the kids get back normally they get together and they go out to the field and they hit and they run and they throw all by themselves but they weren't allowed to use the facilities so that was hard too, because then they had to find their own facilities. They were going around the city of Muncie trying to find a public park just to be able to do what they love to do. Mm -hmm. And then even when we were, we started school, then, you know, as you probably recall, Hannah, they, they didn't allow any of the sports to start right away. Alrighty, and we're back, of course, great words of wisdom from him. So, um, one Ball State pitcher that was drafted recently was Kyle Nicholas. He was drafted into the Marlins organization and, you know, the, mi uh, the minor leagues hasn't really had their opportunity to shine yet. So what do you guys see from him? So no, yeah, I think um, he has a lot of potential coming out and everything. That's why they drafted him so high in the, se not so high in the second round, but that's why they drafted him in the second round because 
he had a lot of potential coming in. I wouldn't say he had outstanding seasons his freshman and sophomore year, and then that junior year he really took off. But right now, um, like you said, there's no minor league games going on, so they have a camp set up with the Marlins where he's practicing with a few of the like main people on the main team, the, that, well, the MLB team. So that gets him a few reps and everything to stay in shape. And then also they're playing a dozen games against the Nationals, the Washington Nationals. So with him getting able to get some PT time and reps out there, I think it will really help him come a long way. Definitely. Yeah, Jay, you don't really, we didn't really get to see much of him uh, over the minor weeks since they didn't play any games. But I'm just more excited to see him next, uh, next spring uh, in, the off, in the preseason. Oh, yeah. Definitely, yeah. And at Ball State currently, which players do you see potentially getting drafted in the future? Um, I chose Noah Navarro and uh, Chase McDermott. And um, I wouldn't say this is like last year where we had Kyle who had a high potential of maybe going pro. I wouldn't say this year we have top prospects that are on the list of, you know, going pro. But I think they have a lot of potential to ball out this year and put their names on that list. And so I think those two are pretty good candidates to go pro. Love to ball out at Ball State. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I also went with Noah Navarro. You know, he's, a, he's always on the bags. He's always getting on base. And he also was 7-for-7 seven seven when he stole uh, this year. So he's very quick. He's definitely somebody you want to rely on uh, when, you're on, when he's on base. Someone else I also picked, probably the best name on the, on the roster, Trenton Quartermain is who I picked. Uh, he was also batting 360. He was second in the lineup, so he was batting right behind Noah last year, and he also had an on-base percentage of 421. So he was on the base on the bags a lot, and that's definitely somebody you can rely on if you need someone to clean up after you. Without a doubt, yeah. Um, but moving forward, I think it's also important to talk about athlete eligibility. So, what are your guys' thoughts on the NCAA allowing seniors to compete again next year? I mean, I think it's great. I think that's exactly what they should have done from the start. I mean, I understand why you have to talk through it, but to me, I think that would have been a very obvious answer you just put out there right away so these seniors don't have to stress about what they're going to do in the next couple of years. But I think it's a great decision allowing these people to come back and give them another opportunity because a lot of people have their breakout year in their senior year. They have a lot of experience. They're very confident in themselves. This is their year. And so taking that away from them can hurt a lot of their lives in the future going ahead, yeah. money-wise and just potentially what are they going to do because a lot of them think that the sport is their future. So I think giving them an extra year is a great, great decision. Yeah, I 100% I agree. I think many seniors, you know, hope to play professionally and losing that senior season can really be make or break. I agree. Yeah, that senior season just always has that special atmosphere around it that it's your final year. It's finally time to ball out if you haven't done so the previous year. So it's definitely something that each, each athlete always looks forward to. Like, as a, as a former golfer, I didn't get my senior season, so I was a little disappointed in that. But, you know, it's always something that you can look back on and realize, oh, I was there, and, and now I can, learn, I, can, I can teach the next generation to look at the small things and appreciate those. No, yeah, and sure. not having a senior night, I mean, that, that would suck. That's just, just yeah. a great night to just, you know, let the school know that they appreciate you. As someone who in high school got their senior season, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine losing that oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, but are there any athletes you could see or even want to see sticking around here at Ball State? Um, I chose two people. I said K.J. Walton because of some circumstances that's going on with him right now, injury-wise and everything. But I also said Drew Plitt. I don't think he will stay, but I think there's a potential where if the season doesn't maybe work out as he thought it would, because, you know, he has a lot of ex high expectations right now. He's potentially draft available, you know. Mm -hmm. He could get somewhere, be a backup somewhere, practice squad somewhere. So that's somewhere that he wants to go. But I don't know, if it doesn't work out for him this year, I think he'll maybe come back for a redshirt senior year and just try to do it again. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I went with Ishmael El Amin on that one. Uh, just somebody that is always, always somebody you can rely on and, you know, always on the basketball court. And this year, I'm looking uh, forward to him balling out with, KJ, hopefully, KJ Walton. No. Yeah, Ish with the swish. That is a <laughs> perfect transition <laughs> because we are talking about men's basketball next. So, you know, the men's uh, basketball season um, showed a lot of potential, especially with their younger athletes. Um, this year, however, the team only have two incoming freshmen and, and a transfer student one of which is the first ever European player to come to the men's team, and I really, really hope that I don't butcher his name, but Timu Sukas from Finland. Um, 
how important do you guys think it is to really look everywhere for young talent? I mean, honestly, putting your eyes beyond the horizon of America is huge. I mean, it's a growing, basketball outside America is growing every day. I mean, you see players coming in the NBA league every year, like we have Luca, we have Giannis. I mean, these are top five players in the NBA now, and there's a lot of young kids still out there who have a lot of talent out there that really a lot of people don't stay focused on them because they're used to all these Americans playing basketball and going to these big Duke schools and all that. But, you know, you can always find hidden gems out there in the world, especially someone who's really young like him, who's played with grown men his whole life. And so ha having that and bringing that here, I think is going to be huge. And I really like him. Timu looks like he's a really good player, so I'm excited to have him here. And I think going overseas is very smart because I don't know if a lot of other colleges are really doing it as much as maybe like Ball State, for instance, mm -hmm. because I know the women's team has a lot of overseas. Yeah, uh, two from Spain. Yeah. Exactly. We have a lot of overseas women over there. So I think this is a fresh start for us, gives us a new idea of maybe where we can go for the future. And I think overseas, like recruiting, is a very smart idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on that. Uh, I would say the sports world just doesn't really have a boundary. You, uh, uh, a good example is here at Ball State, the football team, we got a new punter from Australia, Lucas Barrow. So definitely there's no boundaries when it comes to trying to find someone for the right spot. No, yeah, if you can play, you can play. Yeah, with that, that, yeah without it, I, you know, I know we're not talking about football right now, but I thought it was really interesting that we had someone from Australia. So maybe we can talk about that at a later date, unfortunately, no, no, not soccer. today. Yeah. Kicking above the side, who knows? I guess, yeah, just, just <laughs> kicking it. Uh, <laughs> but reeling it back in, <laughs> how do you think Sukas as a guard can help um, step up the team's offense? I mean, like I said about having, him having this experience, I mean, overseas you're playing with grown men. You start playing with them at the age of 14, so you really have that experience at a really young age. And coming here is going to be a different mentality for him because he's now playing kids his age. And so maybe he'll be a little more confident with it. And also, he shot, he was the leading three-point percentage-wise at his league in Finland. So I think that, bringing that here, you know, foreigners, they can shoot. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of good foreign players out there that can shoot. So I'm really excited for that. I think he shot like 43% from three last year overseas. So that right there has got me excited. I think he can add a lot to this team with experience, what he can bring on and off the table, what he's been able to do overseas. It's a whole different world over there with basketball and stuff. So I think with that and his ability to be able to shoot, we'll come a long way. Yeah. Yeah, also the, the, the one great thing about these European players is they always have that sense of leadership around them since they're playing so young. And with Timu being that sharpshooter that he is, he's definitely going to be someone to kick to in the corner or just for a spot out, spot out three uh, when we're down and we need a, big, a quick bucket. Exactly. For sure, yeah, and another guard that made a lot of contributions last season was KJ Walton, and like we mentioned earlier, his season was cut short due to a knee injury, so how do you think he's feeling with everything COVID-related, potentially missing out on another season? Um, mentality, I think he's probably good, you know, I think he's in a happy place, because if you, in a scenario like this, where it's a lot going on of COVID and the injury, and then you're mentally not in a good place, that's going to hurt you in so many ways on and off the court. Mm -hmm. So I think hopefully he's in a good mentality, like good place right now, hoping to get back this year, but taking it slow. We don't want to risk anything, push him too hard. So hopefully he understands that it's a day-to-day -day basis Definitely. and he can just hopefully stay happy and stay confident in himself that he'll come back to be able to play basketball. Yeah, yeah that's the biggest key uh, is just staying happy because the, the only thing you want to do if you, when you get hurt as an athlete is to get back on the floor, to get back to playing. And if you have a serious injury like what KJ Walton has, uh, you have to understand that it's, it's gonna take time and you're gonna have to nurse this back to full health in order to play at your full ability. Definitely, yeah, especially, yeah, knee injuries for, you know, a basketball player is, it's really sad and I hope that he can get back to that full oh, ability. I, I hope we'll see him on the court. Oh yeah. More people that I hope to see on the court, of course, is women's basketball. So last season, they also had a lot of ups and downs. Um, and one way the team is definitely trying to correct these downs is by hiring a new assistant coach. Um, head coach Sally himself said that he was beyond excited to have um, Roman Tubner 
um, assist him. So how are you guys feeling about this new change? Um, I'm excited for Coach Tupper, actually. Um, he's done a lot in his career. He's very big in the Indiana area for women's coaching. And uh, in, at Indiana State, he coached for a couple seasons there, I think two seasons. And within those two seasons, last season, he um, he at, they averaged 65 points, 62 points a game. And that's the highest they've ever had in five seasons. So him coming here, I think, he has a lot of potential, and he's an offensive guy, and he's ready just to attack, attack, attack. And we have a lot of key players that are meant to just attack, attack, attack. So I think with his mentality and the way we're already set up, I think he'll be a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tubner is also a very young, uh, very young coach. He's actually made a list, uh, the 30 under 30 list, where it actually talks about the top 30 coaches or upcoming coaches that are under 30 years old. So having that youngster uh, connection with the players is always going to help because he'll understand kind of what they're going through and how they can fix it and how they can turn that into wins on the court. Yeah. For sure mental toughness I, I personally believe is just as important as physical toughness. Oh, 100%. If not more important. Definitely yeah. Um, so as we bring in the new we have to talk about pushing out the old. So the women's team had a few seniors graduate um, after last season um, of these athletes, who are you guys going to miss seeing the most? Um, I'm going to have to go with Jasmine Sams. She was a graduate student, so she's been here for, she had been here for five years. She is no longer with the organization because she has moved on to bigger and better things. But she, like I said, she's been here for five years, so that experience that she just had on the court, she was a leader. She was a natural leader on the floor. She was a great facilitator. She loved to pass, and if she needed a score, she did. She got into double digits more than like eight times this past season. She played 29, she started 29 of the 31 games this whole season, and then also by the end of her season, she was a tw the 29th player for women's history at Ball State to get 1,000 points. So right there, that's an accomplishment. Congrats to her for that. So I think she's going to be a big piece of someone that we're going to miss because just her leadership and just what she could do on the court, passing-wise, and maybe if you know she needs a bucket here and there, she'd get it for you. So I think she's going to be missed a lot. Mm -hmm. A thousand points. I don't think it's a bucket here, here and there. True. True. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on that, Jet. Uh, I also said that we were going to miss Aubrey Benson. You know, she was just always a really good player to rely on uh, late in the game and. Just a, another guard that was quick on the court and back on defense very quick. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome person, too. Every time I ever went to practice, always super kind going in as well. So as they leave, um, who do you think is really going to step up and help lead the team in their absence? Um, to me, I feel like, I don't know, I'm not going to say it's an easy option, but to me, I think it's easy that we have Ashlyn Brown down, down in the paint. So, I mean, we just, I think, I don't know if she'll be the leader of the team mentally wise, like in the locker room, but I think she can be because she's such a presence. Like, she's scary. I mean, like, you don't want to, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't want to play her at all. So I feel like people would respect her game to the fact to where they'll respect her off the court and in the locker room and stuff. So I just think that her presence She's just going to be huge. She was all Mac last year. She's also, she was the 28th person, 28th woman basketball player to get 1,000 points. And she's not done. So she's still growing and she gets double doubles. She had 22 double doubles last year. She's just an all around great basketball player, I think, with a mentality and just the way she plays. She's a, she's a hooper. Very mature as well. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go with Thomas DeSaga's daughter on this one. She's just an all, she's just a great person all, all, all around. And she's also a scorer at heart and she she also has that European experience that she's bringing over from uh, from Europe so definitely someone that can can lead this team uh, to a victory with uh, Ashlyn. Ashlyn. <laughs> yeah sorry I'm still a freshman so I don't know all the players but it's all right that's why we're here to help you thank you you got you got us we're a team for a reason exactly. team, exactly. exactly. team work makes the dream work yes team Cardinals sports live <laughs> We should make an intramurals team. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Again, reeling it back in. Um, I I just can't let us sign off without talking about football. It is two weeks away. I'm very excited. So last year the team didn't really end on the highest of notes. They were so close to making you know the MAC tournament, but just didn't quite get there. Do you think that this has lit a new fire underneath them for the season? Um, yeah, I think it lit a huge fire and also I think it put a lot of pressure on them too. You know, um, they they came out hot last year with I think a mentality where they they want to put themselves on the map and do something but it kind of fell dim 
a little short by the end of the season. So I think that ticked them off a lot. Yeah. So I think they're definitely ready to get back out there, and that's the fire. But the pressure is because they know, we know that they have a lot of, their best players are seniors. They have a lot of senior players who are their star players. So I think the pressure is hot on them because this is their year. If they want to do something, this is it. This is the chance, and if they miss out on it, then I don't think it's going to look good on the paper or in their head. So I think right now is the time to take it, and that's the pressure, I believe, because they know they can win it. It's just can they. It's just can they execute it. Exactly. Yeah. I agree with you guys on that. It's all about the consistency as well. You exactly. have to be consistent in your scoring. You have to be consistent in putting up points on the board. And if you fall just a little bit short, that can turn a game completely to the other side, and that can turn a lot of wins into a lot of losses. So the team just needs to remember to stay consistent in what they're doing in order to get those wins secured. Yeah, speaking of wins, we were able to see the team have consecutive wins last season. Should we expect anything less than that this season? Um, I expect more. I mean, I, I, just, I expect more just because, like I was talking about, their experience. They have a lot of people coming back that are just studs on the field. I mean, we have Huntley and we have Plitt coming back, and they're both on lists for awards this season. I mean, Huntley led the league in running. So I think with that, with his pressure and all that, I think we need to be better, and I think we need to execute better, like you were saying. We need to finish the game strong, be consistent. So I think, yeah, I, just, I think we have a lot to do this year, and I think it can be a great season or it can be a bust. Let's not talk about that. Only great seasons, only positive notes. You took the words right out of my mouth, Jed. I mean, we have so much uh, expectations for Drew dime dropping play. Yeah. And, <laughs> and with all these awards and stuff, you don't want that to get into your head too much because then you might be thinking, oh, well, I have to do this and this and this to get that, to get, uh, to win this award. But it's, it's not all about one person. It's all about the team. And it doesn't take one person to win a game. It takes, it'll take Drew Plitt, it'll take Caleb Huntley, it'll take the receivers, it'll take the defense, it'll even take special teams. But it's all about staying together and staying as a family. No, yeah, I agree. That's, I mean, you could, I couldn't put that any better. Just his mentality, he needs, to, he needs to know that he is the leader of this team and we all support him, but he can't let those, the, the accomplishments yeah. that he can get distract him from that because at that point, it's all downhill. That's yeah. right. Definitely. All right, well, unfortunately, that is your favorite trio's final words um, for Cardinal Sports Live. This has been Jets Weigel, Nolan Bulman, and, of course, me, your host, Hannah McElroy. We will see you next week.